how much editing do you, should you need to do? Today, I want to talk about the ever present question of to edit or not to edit. Unless you're shooting on JPEG, if you're shooting on RAW, you've got to do some sort of processing to turn that into a file that you can put online or you can put into Final Cut Pro that can be used, sent to a client. Most people don't actually have RAW converters. It's only people with cameras that shoot RAW that need a RAW converter. Just the other night, I was driving home and the skies opened. before I got to my car and I ran for my car and I did this U-turn and then I went, hold it a second, this is epic weather, I've got to capture it. I wound down the window, stopped in the middle of the road and you can see here's the tram track, so not necessarily the, the greatest plan in the world, but I just had to get this shot. I was protected largely by being in the car, but there was so much rain it was just coming in the window. And I snapped off this shot at a quarter of a second. So this is what VR can do for you. Quarter of a second, ISO 100. So if we're shooting RAW, we have to, at the very bare minimum, convert it into a JPEG, a TIFF, a PSD, an EPS, any of those different formats. That's what we have to do before we take another step. And if you look up close, we can see here, even at a quarter of a second at 100%, because I don't see the point of going beyond 100% relative to your screen, we can see here this is all looking great and sharp. So very impressive what we can get away with at one quarter of a second. Isn't that amazing? With the Z7, if we look here, we can see that this is the Nikon Z7 with the 24-70 f4. That's what I've got. I haven't gotten any other lenses yet. So to ensure that we get that process right, we have to use an editor. And there are so many to choose from. Maybe it's Lightroom, Capture One, Photos. You might still be using Aperture because it, it is that good. Focus. Focus is the software that Hasselblad make. You can use Bridge, of course, to work on your files, and you can use Adobe Raw and into Photoshop. Lumix, Photoshop Elements, Infinity, which I know nothing about, Skylum, and finally, DxO Photo Labs. How much editing do you, should you, need to do to an image like this? Anyway, I very quickly realized I needed to get out of, uh, out of my car and I parked it and there were a whole lot of other shots that came from the night. I'll quickly show you some of those. This one here, which is lovely. This one here, which I really like. So I had to get out and move around and use an umbrella and it was lots of fun. And I really, I really like I really like this one. These are cropped to square to go into Instagram, by the way. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, here's the link. If you want to check out my Instagram, this is what it's looking like right now. So these are some, uh, quite a lot of the options now available to convert your raw file into something that you can put online, something you can use, something you can give to your clients, something you can give to your friends, something that you can send to the company that makes your photo book, your greeting cards, your calendars, your posters, or whatever it is that you want to do or you need to do. You've got to convert it into a JPEG or a PSD or an EPS or a TIFF, any of those things, as we've already said. And then of course, well, once you're in there doing that, do you edit your file? Do you leave it as the camera was set and how that metadata is attached with the white balance that it has, the sharpening that's default in the camera, the ISO that was preset and all those sorts of things. Do you leave it as you shot it or do you push, pull, tweak, whatever? Ultimately, I release my images mostly in rectangle. So looking at this image, we can see here, this this is it. Let me open up the editing panel. This, this is what it looks like out of the camera, untouched. So this image looks pretty damn good. Then we move over to the cropped for Instagram version. And all I've done is bring up the shadows a little bit. And the contrast a little bit. And that's it. And I am happy with that image. I think it looks epic. I think it looks cinematic. But of course, we can duplicate this image. So let's clone a new version of that crop because I prefer that crop in this particular case because I don't, I don't love those cars to the left. 
some people really like to turn the color up and you know in 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 the case of this image because there's only color where there's color and then there's largely not color elsewhere it's not as obvious that you're cranking the color but often when people crank the color which happens way too often it everything becomes things that don't have color get color in them like if you can see here this is starting to go green and that is disturbing to me that you start to get colors that just don't exist and so that's pumped to maximum some people do that i don't think it's necessary to have a compelling shot and once they get to this point which i see a lot of images at this point like i said there's this kind of echo of color that just simply shouldn't be there so i really advise against oversaturating I'm shooting with the neutral setting on the Z7. So to throw a little bit of color back in that that thing kind of takes out, I think is fine. Zero to 10, great. That's just putting in pretty much what the camera's taken out. But there's a big difference between this and this. Crazy. There's, there's all this pink everywhere that just actually doesn't exist. Now, I first started using digital in the late 90s, but I started using it professionally in 2004 when I got the Nikon D70. And my goal back then was to make the images from the digital camera look as much like they did from film because I didn't want there to be an interruption in my business. I didn't want my clients to think something had changed. My goal was to make everything as similar as it was before. That was my goal. And of course, that's 15 years ago now. And at that time, I also set myself a rule because when you opened a digital file, even back then, you maybe had something like 15 to 20 data points, brightness, exposure, contrast, saturation, and so on and so forth. So maybe 20 data points, which each had a range of 100 up or 100 down. So that's 200 for each data points, 200 times 20. And that's a lot if you wanted to look at all of them. Now it's far more than that. And the rules that I set myself were, were very simple. I wanted to only use the controls that emulated basically the darkroom. What the darkroom had was the capacity for exposure, the ex capacity for contrast, and dodging and burning. So that means making selective areas lighter or darker. And that was it. They, that was it for black and white. They were the things that I decided to work with. And since that day, I've mainly stuck with those rules, adding just a couple more since. So what I want to do is jump onto the tools. And what here I have, I have open uh, Aperture. I have Capture One and I have DxO Labs. These are all pieces of software that I own. I also have Photoshop, Photoshop Raw, Lightroom, all the different Lightrooms. I don't have Elements. So I have about half of the raw editors on that list behind me there. The one I still love the most is Aperture. I think Capture One is a very close second. It just runs slower. It doesn't run as well on, on my machine. And I don't like the way it archives. It's not as smart as Aperture. But the actual editing of images is similar, if not a little bit better. And uh, DxO Labs, I've only just received that as a bundle with something else. So I don't really know much about it. Oh, so, and I also have Hasselblad's Focus software. And in the end, all of these uh, programs are quite similar and it's, um, it's Lightroom that's the most different and all the rest have actually a similar way of handling things. Then beyond that, the process of editing is absolutely subjective. Like what I try to do is use the absolute minimum in regard to changing the settings from how I saw it and what I photographed because I really want to try and achieve what I saw. That's, that's, that's my goal is to try and emulate what I saw. And sometimes the camera captures it and sometimes you've got to tweak things a little bit because the camera can't catch what the human eye can see. In this case, I'm very happy with it. So very minimal amount of editing. This particular night, I employed a technique that I sometimes employ at night time where I want higher shutter speeds, but I deliberately underexpose so that we don't get camera shake and then I bring the files up, full well knowing there's a lot of dynamic range. And I just want to choose a new file and you and I, we can edit this together. So in this, this night I was stuck with the, uh, the 24 to 70 F4, it just happened to be what I had on me. So in some cases I would have gone beyond the 70 to 
150 or 200. Yeah, let, so let's work with this image. It's a pity that this car's here because I really like that garbage truck. Let's just sort this back by date. And maybe there I took an image before that. Let's have a look. No. Okay. I would have liked to have gone beyond 70 mil, but let's just crop it as if it was like a 130 mil or a 150 mil. I don't know, something like that. Now, cropping and the original framing, I don't normally crop, but for today I'm going to do it. I wouldn't normally, I wouldn't release this image because I have to crop it and I don't normally crop. So this, this is the, here, here is the raw file. Here we are. Now, what I did here was I deliberately underexposed to make sure we didn't get camera shake. Yep, so the background, as we can see here, the tram here is what's in focus. The background's what's in focus, so that's cool as. We're at a 30th of a second, which is stabilized, so that's working fine. It feels dark. This isn't what I wanted, but I'm shooting that way to keep it sharp, full well knowing the immense dynamic range of this camera. And have a look at that crazy level of dynamic range. So we're up three stops. Don't even need to go that far. Let's just do it similar to that other one. There is no sense of any uh, digital noise coming. We'll bring up, sorry, well, I forgot to bring those down as well, but we'll bring up the shadows. And here we have an image that's already well on its way. And as I said, I don't, I don't like this car here and I normally wouldn't work with that there. Let's crop in a little bit, I reckon. And again, this is the, the ridiculous power of a camera like the Z7 is that we're in essence cropping in 50% and we've still got a ridiculous amount to play with. But that's, that's pretty powerful as it stands. Like that's an image I really like. As I said at the start of this thing, you have all, all of these settings, like just a crazy amount of, what have we got here? We've got, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. In, in here, there's probably a thousand. We'll just forget that even exists. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then within here, we've got all of these tools and they all do stuff. So let's just choose a number. Let's say there's 50 settings, each with 100 data points. So basically we're talking about, you know, the, 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 all of these to add, which I haven't added in. There's something like a million variations of what you could do to this image. And one of, I think one of the biggest things when editing a photo is to go, keep it as simple as possible. Keep it as real as possible, unless you're actually trying to create something that isn't a photograph, and that's okay. I'm very happy with people to put, create kind of artworks, but I think it needs to be delineated in artwork. If it's too far from the reality of what was taken, don't call it a photograph anymore. So keep your editing to a minimum and try and keep it relatively real to what you saw, and then you won't even have to worry about those one million permutations. And, and like I said, I think it moves us away from, well, what actually is a photograph. What is a photograph? What is a photograph? I don't think it's a photograph if it's just been distorted beyond too far away from where it originally began. I mean, what do you think? When is a photograph not a photograph anymore? So my bottom line to edit or not to edit, I basically say edit as minimally as you can to achieve the goal that you want. So, you know, another thing I like to play with is vignetting. And sometimes I just like to revisit exactly what lenses used to do before they were digitally they're actually digitally corrected a lot of the time having dark corners is actually what's going on but before the file goes anywhere the camera fixes it fixes the file and changes that and so then we end up having the same degree of brightness all the way across and again it's a personal choice do you like this better where it's more open around the it feels more open or if we do this, if you feel a bit more focused into the center. And sometimes I want to do that, and sometimes I don't. But my level of editing is very, very minimal, and that's the way I like to keep it. I'm proud of doing it that way. I'm still a photographer who's spent just over half of my career analog, darkroom, doing it by hand. You had limited choices. I'm happy to stick with that. I hope that helped give you some ideas about what I do. I like to keep things to a minimum and keeping it real. It also takes a lot of time if you go, you know, I, I like to just whiz through my photos. I might import 200 photos, 45 minutes or 25 minutes later I'm done because I just spend like 15 seconds looking at each one and doing very, very slight tweaks to them. 
Well, that's a nice one. We should have played with this one, shouldn't we? Yes, we should. Oh, look at that. Look at that ski. Not that there. Yeah, 60th of a second, so it's a bit darker. That flat profile's just dragged too much out of it, and I actually think it's a bit green. So, I think the color temperature's a bit out. I want to, I feel like I need to go a little bit here. So this is an image I haven't looked at yet. A little bit here. And a little tiny bit in there. And now, of course, these subtle things are going to look different on every everybody's monitors are going to look a little bit different, so... Some things you're going to go, Matt, what are you doing? That's weird. Well, our monitors are not all calibrated the same. And of course, once it's been through my compression, making the 4K file and your compression, things are going to change, aren't they? They're going to change. Anyway, I quite like that. There we go. Please tell me, how much do you like to edit your images? Do you keep it short or do you make it long? Love to hear. So as always, please like and please share and please subscribe and please press on the bell so that uh, we can continue to see each other moving forwards and you don't miss out. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon. Bye.